listening to SFP Now. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of SFP Now. We've got a heck of a show lined up for you tonight. Uh, Raisa's back and we're going to be talking Star Trek and the Orville. But before we do that, um, you know, Killjoys has been off the air now for about two weeks. Um, two, three weeks it finished. Um, it's third season and it's been picked up for a fourth. Um, a couple of a couple of days ago, I managed to pick up an interview with uh, Kangi McCormack, who plays the uh, role of Zeph um, in season three, and she's very much the standout character in season three as far as the new people go. So we're going to run that interview right now, and and then we'll get straight into the good stuff with uh, Reese or about Star Trek and the Orville. Come, come, come on, right here. I'd like to welcome to the show the fantastic uh, Kenny McCormick, who has made a huge impression on um, on fans of Killjoy with um, you know what has been one of the breakout roles of the series so far. Um, welcome to the show, Kenny. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for the lovely intro. Oh, it's it's cool. It was initially five pages originally, as you, as, as as I was telling you before. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think the first question I'd like to ask you, and I kind of ask this to every actor that that we have on the show, um, in fact, every mm-hmm. artist, um, is uh, when was it that you got into got got into the acting, and how did you get into doing television and film? You know, you know, how, how mm-hmm. what was it, what was your process for? Well, um, I was very lucky that I was struck with the acting bug very young and knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life from a very young age. Essentially, I was, I'd never seen a play. I was seven years old. My mother took me to the Hal Prince revival of Showboat, which is a old musical. Mm -hmm. And I had probably the equivalent of a a seven-year-old panic attack in the audience. I just had this like I saw this woman singing and on stage and I started shaking and kind of like felt such a surge of want and like just true, true inspiration and feeling like I had just been hit over the head with something. And then after that, like I ran upstairs to my room after the, the show and started plotting how I was going to get myself on stage. And uh, I forced my mom to put me in singing lessons and acting lessons and I started in um, mostly in theater and musical theater. I did opera for a long time. Um, and so by the time I was uh, 11, I was on stage in a bunch of different professional plays um, and have been on stage my whole life. Moved to, I went, as I was telling you, I went to school in England, in the south of England, mm-hmm. to like a, a arts school for people who excelled in English literature, music theory, art history, and the, basically the classics. And then I went to London, and then I moved to uh, Los Angeles for a year. Went to school in New York as well, and then performed in New York a lot, a long time as a as a stage performer. And then I moved to Toronto. So I've moved around quite a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, moved to Toronto and started doing more film. Um, I started writing and producing my own like independent films. And as you do that, you kind of uh, bring take your career in your own hands, and people take notice. And then I just started booking more film roles. So now I do a lot more film and TV and less theater, but of course I always want to go back to theater when I can. So that's how it happened, but it's been, you know, I've been performing for 20 years. It's, it's wow. been a, a, a long time. Um, and like I said, I, I was just struck with it. It was divine intervention or some sort of like weird, weird moment in my life that, that I'll never really forget. Of course. Mm-hmm. Do you know what's scary? I've actually seen the movie version of Showboat. <laughs> So I, really? I know what oh, it is. Nice. I is know what the, it is, is you're talking the, about. <laughs> is, is that the Ava Gardner one, the one in 1956 like, or something? Yep, that's um, the one. I um, love, yeah, Showboat. You know, I, I, everyone always asks me like, what your my favorite song is. And I'm like, well, there's a song called Bill from Showboat. 
And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, it, it, it's the reason I became an, an artist. It, she, Lynette McKee came on stage. She sang Bill, which is a song, which is the, the one that, the character that Eva, Eva Green plays in, um, Ava Gardner, sorry, plays in the film. And it just kind of shook my whole world. Uh, but yeah, sh- I have this weird, I have this crazy soft spot for old musicals and obviously Showboat because it will change my life. Mm-hmm. Well, That's great that you've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. I'm, I'm a bit of a film nerd, so I, 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 you know, I like my action movies and my Star Wars and my sci-fi, of course. But mm-hmm, I also mm-hmm. like old movies. You know, one of my favorite old movies, it, you know, is probably it's probably the obvious Christmas movie. It's a Wonderful Life. I like the original yeah, yeah. Sim Scrooge. Um, mm-hmm. My dad used to because I, I grew up in the seventies and we right. didn't have that many new TV shows or new films coming out then on 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 TV. So the diet was mostly old films. So you get Bob Hope, you get the likes of Jimmy Cadney, you get you know all, all these old names from movies, you know, in in yeah. the films that are on. So I, I kind of grew up with with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart in A, a Wonderful Life is, gives a, like a, a timeless performance. It's, every year when I watch that around Christmas, I'm just floored by that performance in that film. Yeah, I, I love Clarence the Angel and, and, and uh, was it Lionel, was it Lionel Barrymore? Did Mr. Potter, was it was that, that the mm-hmm. guy's name? Um, yeah. I mean... It's just it's just an amazing film, and I'm so glad that the plans to remake it um, didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, of course. I know. It's like, I don't know why. It's like, they just don't screw with a good thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I've been looking through your IMDb credits, and uh, one thing you, you, you have done, which is a pretty big production, uh, was a special correspondence with uh, Ricky yes. Gervais. Uh, yeah. What drew you to that show? Um, what what part did you play in that show? And uh, what was it um, like to work with Ricky Gervais? If if you did. Oh my goodness. I well, as I said, I'm a total anglophile, and Ricky Gervais was probably one of the top five people I wanted to work with in my career. I was I watched The Office when it first came out in England. I, I was on top of it before before it had an American iteration. And um, I used to tell my friends in Canada, like, guys, you have to watch this. This is, like, I watched it so long ago. And he is, so I auditioned, I basically I just play, I have a small part, I play his accountant, this kind of, like, really mousy, quiet, nervous accountant named Paula. And um, it's just like, uh, we. End, I think it's just like one scene with him and um, Eric Bana. But, yeah, I auditioned uh, for that part. And I thought that I, I thought that I botched it. Like I thought I did a terrible audition. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, I couldn't believe when I booked it. And when I arrived on set, Ricky comes right up to me. You no, know, you know when you get cast in these, in these big movies with big stars, and then you're mm-hmm. playing just like a little, like a small part. Sometimes you don't even meet the people that you're like the big stars that you're working with. But Ricky comes across the room, and he was like. Kelly, it's so nice to meet you. I loved your audition. Like, I'd love it if you would just do it exactly like in your audition. And then he introduces me to Eric Bana. And then we, he was like, oh, yeah, she did this thing in the audition, which was funny. And, you know, this is how we're going to do the scene. And then he, we started talking about, like, working in, because we were shooting it in this office space. And we were talking about how he obviously used to work in offices, and that's the inspiration for the office. And I was saying how in my early 20s, I was, like, a dental receptionist. We just talked about a bunch of hilarious, um, idiosyncrasies of like of being of being uh, work, working working behind a desk and like the obsession you get about making sure you hold on to like the perfect pen <laughs> and, <laughs> and like not letting anyone like steal your pen and then um, and then yeah we shot the scene and I so when you're sitting when you're sitting when you're setting up a shot mm-hmm. they have to check for eye lines and I am sitting down and he's standing up and I'm staring and they're like, he, they're checking for eye lines. So she, he's, you know, the D, the DP is like, Kelly, can you just look at Ricky? And I'm just staring at him and having this moment being like, I am making direct eye contact <laughs> with like one of my acting, writing and creating geniuses and heroes. And he, so we, we just did the scene and then he would, um, cause he's also, he also directed the film. He would do the scene and then he would like walk behind the monitor and kind of watch me do my own little thing. And he'd start laughing and of course he has this infectious famous laugh Mm -hmm. and making Ricky Gervais laugh was one of the greatest like joys of my career I just couldn't believe it I couldn't believe (laughs) that he was giggling behind the monitor at something I was doing I felt 
so lucky. And afterwards, you know, he was so like he wanted to talk to me about what I was out, up to and what I was working on. And he was just like as nice as people as his reputation was, and so kind. And um, I really hope I get to work with him again one day because it was such a positive experience. And even though I'm only in the movie for a couple seconds, it's, it was still very fun. <laughs> yeah, but that couple of seconds, um, it's usually it usually comes down to maybe about an hour to a couple of hours because of the different um, camera angles and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. You know. I was on set for like the whole day. That was what was nice. It's that nice. But, you know, and you and you, you meet, sometimes when you meet people that in your head are these like larger than life figures and then you meet them and then they kind of normalize for you very quickly and then throughout the day, it's just some another actor who is trying to make art with you. So you get into conversations and you're asking him questions and it's very casual. Um, so yeah, I got to spend a whole day with him, which was which was so good and you know, I, I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy. I couldn't believe it. I was just, this was like, he was just my number one for so long in terms of who I wanted to work with, so... So, Hopefully it happens again. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool. I mean, do, do you have a list of people that you want to work with? Is, it, is there anyone anyone else you can think of that you'd just love to have the opportunity to work with? Yeah, I mean, for me, a lot of them are theatre actors and directors. Like, working with um, Mark Rylance, obviously, he's probably one of the most famous theatre actors of all time. Working with, like, Bernadette Peters or... Stephen Sondheim would be, like, working with Stephen Sondheim, who's the great American composer and lyricist, would be the dream of my life. Um, in terms of film actors, I'd love to work with Gary Ullman, and, of course, like, there's the obvious ones, like Meryl Streep. <laughs> I feel like it kind of goes without saying that everyone wants to work with Meryl Streep. Um, but, yeah, I, I love, I, I, I'm not the kind of actor who who kind of has this, like, I, I try and think of, as the, of these people as my like colleagues in a way you kind of mm-hmm. you have to have to kind of think of that it, not like this um untouchable otherness to them you have to think of them as like someone that you deserve or could one day be on the same level with and not in like a overconfident way just in like a men- the way you have to kind of think about it is um is like these are my these are my these are other professionals in my field so there's a lot of there's a lot of artists that are coming up like with me right now, like uh, young directors and young filmmakers who I would love to work with, who like no one knows about yet. So there's, there's, it's kind of back and forth. But of course, you know, um, working with Idris Elba would be <laughs> That'd unbelievable. Be awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's kind of like uh, you can tend to put people on pedestals and, and put them yeah. up so high that you're, they're unreachable. Um this will make you laugh, actually, because um, I've been doing this uh, now 15 years. Mm-hmm. And when I started, I just started it for a bit of fun. I, I wasn't taking it seriously at all. Um, and one of the first interviews I did on on a phone interview was uh, Nichelle Nichols from Star Trek. And I, rem- I remember being so, so nervous and... Uh, you know, I was still with my mum at the time, um, and I was I was on the phone long distance because it was before we had Skype, <laughs> and, <laughs> and my mum was taking the mickey out of me afterwards because my face was so beetroot red because I was so <laughs> nervous and <laughs> yeah. about it. But you know, but then again, that that was like one of the first interviews I did with someone that was really that was really really famous. <laughs> sort of mm-hmm. thing in in my eyes and it's a song like um but i think i think um as you as you've already found after a while you kind of come to the you come to the conclusion that these people are only human you know yeah and, and you're just yeah. there to share an experience with them you know yeah and i think i i, I mean i understand like when i'm when i'm on set with a really big star you can't it's really i'm more nervous to kind of you want to break through like the, the thought of who they think they are and the veneer, the social veneer and kind of get through the awkward like introduction period where, you know, you're like, all right. Cause there's some, there's some famous actors that you work with who have no interest in interacting you whatsoever. And you kind of have, there's this really awkward moment where you have to figure out like what is the level of their interest in the engagement with some of the actors who are in the film and not playing the leads. Um, but and then at the end of the day, like what I, I kind of think what I meant was you realize that what you do is the same. So it, there's, there's lots of stuff to talk about and you can kind of relate to them. I think I'd be nervous if I met like a real, if I met the queen or if I met like someone, someone who I have, I have, like I met the prime, um, John Cretchen, who was the prime minister of Canada for a long time. I met him, um, 
but he was the prime minister all through my like upbringing. Um, and when I met him, I was like shaking because I didn't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, how do I interact with a prime minister? <laughs> So, yeah, but eventually when you're on set and you meet someone who's, like, a really big deal, you kind of, like, realize very quickly, like, oh, they're just, they're an actor like you are. Like, you know, you're just in a scene with them. Just do your thing. Um, but, yeah, and there's, and there's actors who are really, really good at making you feel like that, like Ricky Gervais, and then there's actors who are not so good at making you feel like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I think in the end, at the end of the day, you just have to sort of, like, go with the flow and just enjoy yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, what's the point in doing something if you're not enjoying it? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, moving, moving on a little bit. Um, I really enjoyed your your role as Zeph in Killjoys, and I'm just wondering what Thank drew you. what drew you to the role, um, and what was it that attracted you to the series? Um, well, I mean, thank you for saying that. I loved playing Zeph. Um, what attracted me to the series, or what drew me to the role, was probably my agent just emailing me saying, <laughs> "I have an audition." <laughs> I mean, there isn't, I, I had been a fan of the show, uh, and because it's shot in Toronto, a lot of my friends had auditioned for it, I had some friends on the show already, uh, so, and I was also a big fan, I'm a big fan of sci-fi shows and sci-fi, um, the sci-fi genre, I grew up reading pretty much exclusively sci-fi and fantasy novels when I was young, um, and, uh, I, in high school, I was in a, an extra on B- Battlestar Galactica for a couple years. Cool. So being and I had worked on, I had a part on Defiance, which is another sci-fi show a couple years back. So I love the I love the whole world of sci-fi. So <clears throat> my my agent knows that. So he, I, he <clears throat> excuse me, he um, sent me an audition for it. It was the first audition of the year in January. I was planning to take off to Los Angeles for pilot season and. So I was packing up my apartment and I auditioned for it. And within a week I was at the table read. So I didn't really get to this, like in this, in this industry, you don't, until you're at a certain level or even when you're not at a certain level, you can't really control the opportunities that come to you. You can only just control what you say no to. So um, I got the audition and I read the description of the character and the size. And this doesn't happen all the time. It actually does not happen that often where I thought like, oh, damn, this is, this is, I got to get this one. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is, I was like, I, no one else can, I had that, that, a thought that I don't have often because I'm always crippled with, you know, self-doubt and anxiety about whether or not I can do this or not do this. But I don't get this thought often, but I thought, like, I'm like, who else is going to play this part? This is mine. <laughs> I had one of those with this character. So thank God it panned out and I actually got the part because <laughs> there's nothing worse than thinking you're like, there's no one else who can play this. And then they cast someone else and you're like, all right. I guess that person did a good job. <laughs> I, I, I just think I just think you're fantastic. You you just saw like made the show for me this season. Uh, oh, you, you that's kind so of nice. added Thank you. You, you kind of added something that that was kind of lacking in the in 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 in, in regards to sort of like the awkward sort of like geek with all the uncomfortable mm-hmm. moments. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. The writers are so. Um, they're so on it. Like when we talked about, and obviously I'd seen the, se- the, the season, but when I booked it, I rewatched the first two seasons and you know, the stakes are ri- rising so fast and so quickly for, um, for Luke and for, sorry, for Dav's character and Johnny and Hannah that, sorry, and Dutch, which is like their character name that I, it's, it's fun because Death brings such an interesting energy because she has no idea of like the previous baggage or, you know, the things they've been through. So she can kind of have that, ignorant um ability to laugh at certain things or or just be that awkward like not really getting it person and and then also they talked about wanting a character uh to have a a a healthy female relationship with dutch as opposed to because dutch has all these you know other relationships with other female characters and this was like a positive potentially sisterhood like um dynamic which i thought was neat that they were interested in bringing that onto the show so yeah, I, I, I was. They were so thoughtful about the way in which they brought in Zeph and how they wrote her. So I was very fortunate. Mm-hmm. You, you, you've had quite a lot of really good scenes with uh, with Dutch as well. And it's almost like mm-hmm. Dutch is kind of like uh, almost looking to sort of like be a bit of a mentor to to your, yeah, you know, to to, to Zeph, who's kind of like really, really talented and good at what she does, but you know, may, maybe a little unsure at times. But you know throws throws help you know you know kind of devil may care as in she'll go and do something anyway <laughs> yeah yeah no I loved all those scenes shooting with Hannah Hannah's such a honest 
and hardworking actor and so talented and kind that those scenes were a lot of fun to shoot. Um, and yeah, and so real. And I guess what's so great about the show is they can toe the line between comedy and and drama and really have these heartfelt moments, but then these opportunities to throw away these hilarious lines, throw like throw in those, these hilarious lines that are, I mean, I, I always say I was so lucky. I got some of the best one liners in the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a funny moment in the uh, in the in the se- season three finale where you were uh, you proposition Johnny, and then as soon as it mm-hmm. starts getting awkward, and she goes, "Oh no, only joking," <laughs> sort of thing. It's kind of like that, <laughs> and I was just yeah. sort of like, I just thought, I "Oh god, that that was just so funny." Um, well, she's, I'm like a very awkward person myself, so <laughs> finding the relishing in her awkwardness was a lot of fun especially that moment too because she thinks it's almost like she's watched a bunch of movies and she's like wait i know how to stop him i know how to save this situation i'll just say this very dramatic thing and then she backpedals it was Mm. yeah i mean i you know i kind of felt sorry for her in that moment but i also thought it was really funny you know because she she, she, there is she obviously does have a thing for johnny right you know i mean who would to be honest (laughs) <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think Zeph this season, she was thrown into, I mean, think about it. She has this new job. It's super stressful. She's thrown into this crazy mix and then they're going to go to war. I think she was just a little overstressed and, um, you know, just trying to figure out where she fits. <laughs> like, and, and, and the nice thing is that there was so much revelation for all these other characters in the, in the show, like Tom Allison's character, Pri, mm-hmm. and, you know, all these other wonderful backstories kind of um, revealed. It was so fun to kind of play the one who is just trying to, like, awkwardly kind of move through the crowd. Like, oh, okay, yeah, oh, I'm over here. Here it is. All right. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. She's so awkward. I mean, I, mean, I, I love I loved the revealing of Pri, you know, because Pri, when he's tending the bar, he's about as gay as they come. And yeah, mm-hmm. you know, w- when he's on on his planet with his with his with his bro sort of thing, he's sort of like the kick ass warrior guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just thought that was just so that's funny. Great. You know, it's, it was just a brilliant character twist. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, Michelle Avretta, the showrunner, is so brilliant in you know not letting anything fall into a stereotype and just turning things around and 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 letting characters kind of go in interesting directions that. I don't know if I don't know if every show does that in a way, like especially for some of the female characters and um, the characters, um, like like you said, Pre's character. It's like it's so easy just to let things fall into stereotypes, and then she just kind of changes everyone's expectation of it mm-hmm. so quickly and so thoughtfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I am. Um, you know, I, I started off being a little bit unsure of Pre's character in the first season, but in the second season, you started to grow on me. You know, it's, right. it's kind of like, uh, you know, the characters are just really well written. I mean, I, I, I love Michelle and love Retta's work on um, on Lost Scale as well, which is a brilliant yeah. show. Um, you know, I, 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 like that, I like that show as well. I love that show as well. That was also shot in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, when I watch Killjoys, I get the impression that the cast is very, very comfortable with each other and, and love what they do. <laughs> Uh, how, how have you found working with the cast and how long do, do, did it really take you to um, start feeling that you fitted in? Uh, the Killjoys cast in Toronto is notoriously for being one of like the happiest families of a cast. The cast and crew, the writers, the producers are having, we have so much fun. It is, I've never quite, I've never been on a set that, that had the vibes that Killjoys has. The actors Aaron, Luke, and Hannah have are the biggest goofballs on the planet. They just are laughing all the time, um, joking around, and you know this is. I think that honestly, with the success, I think one of the successes in the show is that there seems to be such a such good chemistry on on camera, and all that chemistry is because those three actors just adore each other and are so funny and so kind and so thoughtful. Um, so when I came in, I really had no idea what was in store for Zeph or how big the character was. So I didn't really know that I was a part of Team Awesome Force. I didn't understand, like, I didn't quite, I thought I was going to be in like one or two episodes. Um, but Aaron and Hannah and Luke made me feel so welcome and were just like, we, the four of us would sit in like between takes in these chairs and just talk and talk and talk. And, 
um, I, I have been on sets where like you have, you know, you're a new character on something and it takes a long time for you to kind of be invited into the inner workings of the chemistry or the relationships between the, the lead characters. It wasn't like that with these guys. They were, they made me feel a welcome so quickly. Um, and their energy is, is something that I'm really attracted to in terms of just in artists and people in general, they just have the right attitude. And that's why I think, you know, I ultimately the show got picked up for two more seasons the, I, I think the, the best part of that for us is that we all get to see each other more. And that's really a, an ideal situation mm-hmm. um, as an actor. Because you don't, you don't always get that. You don't always get sets where you feel the most comfortable. And sometimes, sometimes that's important, that the sets feel more, a little more tense or you feel a little more terrified or feeling like you have to. This one is just, it's so playful. It's so playful. That's like the number one word I would use to describe the Killjoy set. Cool. Um, the season three finale after us with a, a lot of stuff to chew over over the next year. Are you as surprised as us fans when you actually get get your scripts and see what's happening? And, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, you. It's it's so much fun to be in a show that you're also a fan of, and that you're also a fan of the genre because you get to the table reading, they hand you a script, and you get to sit there and read it live with everybody for the first time, and. And, you know, the network is on the, on the line and the writers are there. And it's thrilling because as a writer as well, I'm also a writer, and I, and I sit there and just go, gosh, these scripts are so good and they're so fun. And then you sit there going, oh, my gosh, oh, that's, oh, my, oh, no way, no way. And you're like, wow, what? And then everyone leaves with such excited energy because you know that the script we just read is what we're going to be shooting over the next two weeks. Um, so, yeah, like reading the finale Reading, Han- listening to Hannah do both voices of Anila and Dutch in, in the room at the same time, like knowing that they were going to finally meet and finally fight was, it was chilling. It was like, we all had goosebumps. It was so rad. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. She, she was awesome. Um, oh, as, as both, so both characters. Absolutely awesome. Um, and you know, not, not, not a lot of actors can actually pull that off. So yeah, yeah. she pulls it off to the point where I forget that it's, Hannah like that she and Neela is so weird and the voice she gives her is so disturbing and so like spoiled childlike that I forget that it's two this is the same actor when they're fighting each other it's, it was brilliant I'm so impressed um well we've got season four and five coming up um over the next mm-hmm. couple of years um what sort of things would you like to see happen to you know happen with Zeph Oh, over the next coming years, you know, if, if you if you had your if you had um, a say in the matter. Uh, I mean, of course, I've thought about this. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, what do I want for Zeph? I mean, I think uh, this 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 arc for this season was was pretty was was simple in a good way, and that it was she's this person who trusts her science and trusts her herself, and doesn't isn't a team player and. Um, always needs to be right, and uh, and now she's kind of finally learned to be part of a team and, and trust and trust in other people that they have her back and she can have theirs. And I think when I see some, and I can relate to this, like when I see someone who always needs to be right and only trusts herself, it usually comes from a place of um, of great hurt, of feeling of like, why is it that she, why is it that she's a little bit of a recluse and she, you know, didn't doesn't seem to have any friends and 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 isn't um, isn't trusting in other people or or needs to prove herself in a way that is so intense that she's blindsided by like just basic social interactions. So I think it'd be interesting for me to see why Zeph, like what her origin story is a little bit and how she, like where she was before this, um, where her love of science comes from, because she talks about growing up on a farm and um, she's interested in biology. And I think me growing up in British Columbia and Vancouver in Canada, like nature and the attachment to nature is such a, a real thing that I'd be, I would like to explore that, you know, why, why organics, why biology, why why does she feel that science is the only thing she can trust? Um, that would be the dream, would be to have a origin story situation. And then also, you know, like clearly Zeph wants some sort of, you know, situation romantically or even just temporarily <laughs> romantically. Mm-hmm. Like, who knows? I don't know. She she looks like she's vying for something. So I don't know what, I don't know what the plan is. Um I, that that would be that would be my interest. No. <laughs> also, I always say episode ten was the first time I was allowed outside because it was the only time I shot outdoors, and so I think that it'd be maybe Steph could go outdoors more. 
Yeah, I was thinking that myself uh, because you've been stuck on the ship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for most I would of it. want. To, it'd be fun to go on a mission or to, you know, shoot. I, I don't know what the plan is for shooting, and I have no idea what my what's in store for my character, if if at all. I mean, you, you never know with these things. Um, but I think the response to the character and and the and the, the incredible support from fans and stuff hopefully made an impression enough that. <laughs> That Michelle wants to keep me around. I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm just thankful that you're not a monk. You know, because right. seemingly if you're monking <laughs> in in Killjoys, you get killed at the end of the season. Right. It's kind of like a rule. <laughs> well, that that was also, you know, people were tweeting at me about, you know, like kind of slightly hitting on Johnny. It's like everyone who Johnny falls in, like he, who like falls for Johnny ends up dead. So I'm a little. I'm like, you know, I'd be fun if death had a, like maybe a romantic situation but i'm a bit wary that if she falls for johnny and something happens that she'll die mm, yeah <laughs> I'm like, don't die i don't want to die <laughs> yeah you know so i make um so aaron ashmore he's a kiss of death if you fall for his characters on shows That's exactly <laughs> i know and like because no one they can't kill john they're never gonna they can't kill johnny he's like the best like you can't so it's like to, sometimes to you know create these dramatic situations it's like oh, we gotta kill off your lover mm -hmm. I just don't want to die but if I do die I hope it's in some sort of epic like blaze of glory yeah I mean you know, may, may, maybe maybe if you do die they'll give you a, a 45 minute death scene yeah exactly <laughs> maybe or just like oh, I'll die I'll come back to life I'll be a hologram forever who knows mm -hmm. I was um, being a hologram is always on my I have a hilarious long like bucket list of weird things I want to do on camera and being a hologram was one of them and um I have a couple other ones but I, I was joking with the Stefan who's the who's like the executive director of the show and I was saying how like dying like this type of death scene was on my bucket list <laughs> so hopefully you didn't hear it too much mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, as you know, uh, fans of science fiction shows are at streaming oil and often follow the mm -hmm. actors on other projects. Um, is there anything from the work that you've done so far that you think your 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 kill by your your killjoy fans might enjoy? Oh yeah, that I mean, I have some fans from. I mean, they're they're I just they're lovely followers and people. I have I have people following me from Defiance who follow who I was on I was on Defiance for a couple episodes. And they followed me onto Killjoys, which was so cool and um, so rad. I, I love I love interacting with people who are fans of the show because I'm a fan of so many sci-fi shows and the sci-fi genre. In terms of what I've done before, um, I do a lot of independent uh, independent work of my own my own filmmaking, mm -hmm. and I kind of consider myself a little bit of a character actor. I like playing completely different characters that are unrecognizable to each other. Um, you know, I did a, I did a TV show that I produced called The Nadoes of Duquesne Island, which I know that sounds like a crazy title. It's called The Nadoes of Duquesne Island. It's online. Um, it, it's on YouTube in the, in the UK, uh, cause it's, it's like, it's basically on our CBC, it's a CBC show, which is like the Canadian BBC. Mm -hmm. Um, so I produced that and I, it's like an old seventies, like mockumentary type thing. And I play a really weird, like bizarre twisted, like twin sister, kind of like the two girls in the shining, like very scary looking twin sister. Um, and I did, um, I was, I was in an episode of eleven twenty two sixty three, which is the Hulu's, uh, Stephen King novel, um, starring James Franco, which was, I played a really weird part in that as well. Um, and in terms of specifically sci-fi fans, though, I mean, I just hope to do more sci-fi, and I can't really announce it, but, like, there's the potential that I'll be on another sci-fi show. Cool. <laughs> so I can't really say anything, but, um, yeah, hopefully hopefully fans will be interested in following me on that journey as well. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you on that one. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Um, um yeah. So, and I'm also, I mean, I, I'm also, as, as a writer and a producer, I'm optioning a couple of sci-fi books and working on my next feature, which is sci-fi driven. So I'm going to be in this world for a long time. So hopefully we'll be chatting for years to come on this topic of, you know, um, connecting with sci-fi fans and, and the genre, because it's, 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 it's a genre I'm really passionate about, for sure. Okay. Can fans follow you on Twitter? Yeah, for sure. I'm on Twitter as Kel McCormack. So it's, ha it's at K-E-L-M-C-C-O-R-M-A-C-K. And I'm, I'm on there a lot. 
<laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna add you to my Twitter now. Um, I'm, I'm at Sci-Fi Pulse, so <laughs> it's Great. nice and easy. I will, I will, I will follow you back, and I'll see you on Twitter. Okay, well, well, thanks a lot for your time, Kagi. It's been brilliant having you on the show, and all the very best of luck with, um, with everything. Um, and I hope we're seeing Thank you for a long time to come. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Hey everybody, this is Daniel Corey, writer of Image Comics Moriarty and Red City and Danger Cats Ludworth, and you are listening to SFP Now. Okay, well that was our interview with uh, Kenny McCormick. I'd, I'd like to, you know, thank her again for her time. It was great having a chat with her about the show and everything. And um, I'm looking forward to season four, given how season three ended. But now we're going to move on to a, a different subject in Tiny, and, and uh, Raisa is here to talk with us about Star Trek Discovery and the Orville. And when we say the Orville, we don't mean the, uh, the green little duck puppet that Keith Harris used to play with. Um, I don't think... I, I'm, I'm guessing, Raisa, you got that reference. No, yeah. You, you do, you do recognise the reference. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> God, I wanted to shoot that fucking green duck when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go on a regular duck shoot. Uh, I wanted to get Keith Harris as well. He just bought out the homicidal rage within me. <laughs> okay, so the Orville or Star Trek Discovery, which one should we start on first? Let's start with uh, let's start with Discovery because that's the one that's freshest in our minds. That's the one that Eric last night is it i've forgotten what happened already <laughs> okay uh star trek discovery um last night was the uh pilot two-hour event for those that have cbs on access the uh one hour non-event for those that have cbs and the reason i say one hour non-event is because uh not a great deal happened in the first hour other than setup mm. um I mean, we did see Michael Burnham and uh, and her relationship with the captain set up somewhat, mother and daughter relationship, which I felt came across really well. Yes, um, yes. And we did see the really cool uh, bit with the Evo suit, which was kind of like a callback to Star Trek the motion picture in so many ways. Yes. You know, and, and that bit was really cool. I like the opening credits, although I've heard people complaining about the opening credits because there's no space in them <laughs> and stuff like that. Well, it's a space show. We're going to see space no matter what happens, so I don't care about that. <laughs> but I, I like the opening credits. I thought they, they were pretty cool with the uh, diagrams of the uh, phases and, and starships and everything. I, I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, and I and I really liked how they incorporated the, the musical theme was very good. There was just enough of the original to convey originalness, but it was new too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. but the uh, the problem with the the pilot for me was the Klingons, and it's not just the look of the Klingons, which everyone seems to have problems with um, on the internet. There's people saying, oh, there better be a good explanation for this. And uh, there's other people saying, well, they don't need to explain it because it's a fucking reboot, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So um, I think if it's a reboot, they should just own up to it and own it. Yes. Yeah. That that was my my biggest thing. If this is a reboot, be a reboot. If this isn't a reboot, explain yourselves, but pick one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because they're they're, they're, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, and it's not working. Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, the uh, the problems I have with the Klingons was the, uh, I found the subtitles to be a bit fast with my dyslexia. Um, it was okay in the first hour. It was really that long conversation where he addresses a Klingon council, mm-hmm. where it got difficult for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, plus, the, the, the whole thing with the Klingons was a massive, big, huge info dump, which just didn't need to happen. No, no. Because... Anyone who's watched Star Trek before knows what the Klingons are about. So yes. we didn't really need that explaining to us. And, and the new fans don't care. So you're wasting, you're wasting everybody's time. Yeah, all, all the new fans care about is um, who's going to have sets with who and, um, and who's going to shoot first. And, Pretty much. Um, you know, wh- wh- when's the next big battle coming from? You know, that's all the new yeah. fans care about because that's all you've seen in the Jar Jar Abrams films. Yeah. But that said... This wasn't 
JJ JJ Abram style. This was a more more in line. I I'd say it falls somewhere between DS9 and TNG in terms of the style that it's been done, the acting and which, stuff like that. Which I which I'm fine with because and granted there was a lot of character beats which I was very thankful for um, relative to the JJ Abram stuff, but. The thing is, having seen all of Deep Space Nine, I prefer Deep Space Nine because Deep Space Nine was darker, but there, but there were more character beats. There were, there were, there was more of a sense of universe. There was more of a sense of character. Yeah, I think the reason for that is I think basically the uh, the, the behind the scenes troubles that they had on this show. I think probably a majority of them took part place during the uh, making of these first two episodes. Um, that's that's why I suspect anyway. Um, uh-huh. But I watched the uh, after track show with that irritating bearded guy that I just wanted to put my fist through the TV and knock uh-huh. his teeth out um, because he was just way way too super camp and um, obviously being on something other than caffeine. Um, <sighs> the, the way he was. He, he was going on about it. Yeah, I, did, I, did, I didn't have time for After Trek, so I'll take your word for it. Well, they, they had one of the producers on, on, on the After Trek show, um, and I, I, I wasn't intending on watching it. it. Just, you know, I was watching the uh, the whole thing again on Netflix this afternoon because I wanted mm-hmm. to see what it looked like on my bigger TV instead right. of my part in my room. And right. it was um, it looked much better on my bigger TV, put it that way. Uh, okay. And they had one of the producers on the After Track show, and he was saying that the intent with um, with this whole whole two hours, with this first two hours, was to have it be one huge prologue to the actual series. And I think that's where I think that's why why it came across as somewhat sort of like um, a bit clunky. Mm, okay, maybe. Um, I'm hoping that's it because I, you know, I'm really hoping that the episodes are a bit faster paced um, in 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 the weeks to come. Not too much faster paced because you know we don't want them to be so like shallow. But we, you know, what we don't want is we don't need to have as much expositional stuff going on. No, no. You know, you know. So and, if, and if and if there needs to be expositional stuff, then they need, like you said, to cop to the fact that they're a reboot and call it a day. Mm-hmm. But what I, what I enjoyed quite a bit about this is um, they didn't rely on engineering and a bunch of techno babble to get them out of the situation, which was something no. that TNG was very guilty of, and Voyager as well, you know? Yeah. You know, so, oh, we just have to decouple the neural stabilizers in order to reboot his brain, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. In, you know, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things one of the things I appreciated. Um, I had my issues with the series structurally, but one of the things I liked is the fact that Nicholas Mayer, who penned the screenplay for my, my still my favorite uh, Star Trek movie, Wrath of Khan, is involved with this series. And there was a very Kobayashi Maru uh, feel to Michael Burnham's dilemma. Mm-hmm. It's like it's not. It wasn't about which. It wasn't about right or wrong. It was about what stakes she decided were more important because she was going to lose on some level no matter what. And so this was this mutiny, what became her mutiny, was essentially her Kobayashi Maru. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, ele- that element of it really came through. And I think that was Nicholas Mayer who gave us Kobayashi Maru in the context of, uh, in the context of Wrath of Khan because Kobayashi Maru was introduced in that film. It had not been introduced prior to that. Yeah, I remember that uh, moment, and they they actually used Kobe Ashimiru in the uh, first two thousand nine Star Trek movie as well. Oh, oh, that's right, they did, they did. Um, okay. But they they basically shown how how uh, Kirk cheated it. Yes, but, that's right. I, I'm remembering, yeah. yeah. But um, it wasn't really done very well. <laughs> no, this was this was a better variation. Mm-hmm. In, indeed, it was. I mean, um, I also liked Sharu, the, um, the the new alien character. Oh uh, yes, bless his heart, Doug Jones, proving that it's not proving that it's not the fault of the Klingon makeup. It's the fact that the actors don't know how to act through makeup. 
Um, <sighs> actually, I, I think it is a fold of the Klingon makeup because the Klingon makeup is caked on way, way too thick to the point where you know they can't even move their faces. Mm. Um, whereas um, at least in the uh, in 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 the next generation and uh, DS9 Klingons, they could actually move their faces, could move their cheekbones a bit more than than they could in that thing. Um, and you know, also they they were actually using uh, the the exact Klingon dictionary guy, the guy that guy that wrote the dictionary, Mark Oprand. Yes. They yeah. were u- they were using his language letter for letter and syllable for syllable, whereas in the um, in the next gen and um, and DS9, there was quite a lot of improvisation went on with 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 the uh, language, which they okay. they didn't use. So that might be why it seemed a bit stiff because they weren't allowing too much improvisation to happen. You know, but um, you know, I I think to be honest, the the guy playing the main Klingon Tikumba did pretty well. Yeah. You know, he, he he did pretty good. Yeah, for what he was given, he did very well. They were. But mm-hmm. well, yeah, I mean, so like, um, I think the way they're setting this up is that um, Burnham's the first staff meet officer to be convicted of mutiny. Yes. And um, now we know why they removed the uh, tenant from the uh, Roddenberry Bible that staff meet officers um, cannot be in conflict with each other. It's because of that, I reckon. But at the same time, to be honest, that that tenant of a uh, Roddenberry's Bible wasn't really introduced to Star Trek until the next generation, so we yeah. didn't have it in Kirk's time. Yeah, yeah. So I think from that point of view, it's um, it, it's pretty good. Um, but the Klingons just don't fit in with canon whatsoever, and they're no. going on about do, doing their best to respect canon, and the Klingons just don't, you know, fit. No, they they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, and it's gonna back, and, there, and there's and there's already a level at which it's backfired. And here's the thing: even though there are parts of this that I like very much, um, this is a Star Trek spinoff the way that Class was a Doctor Who spinoff, mm-hmm. which, in other words, very very loosely. And they Class was was them just trying to piggyback off of their known franchise because they thought it was their best bet to try and do that. This is the same problem for Star Trek. Um, This doesn't feel as Trek-like as as even Deep Space Nine felt. Yeah, but let's let's remember here, Deep Space Nine had the advantage of uh, there being another Star Trek show on at the same at the same time. So that that series had to be more uniformal to what was going on in Next Generation at that time, in terms of designs and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, we've not actually had anything new Star Trek related on television in thirteen years. Mm. You know, so. You know, you can't. We kind of got to cut them a little bit of snack, but um, I won't. I, you know, I'm not really. I, I just don't know what's going on with these Klingons at all. I don't know. We're going to see um, a Klingon how it's meant to look in this particular time period. Or, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm hoping that whatever this storyline is, it will lead to like there. Are, there are 24 houses, and I'm hoping that what's going to happen is that at the end of this. Whatever, whenever that is, whether that's this season or next season or whenever it is, that the the victorious house, the house that overrides all the other houses or, or makes peace or does whatever it does, is the house that looks like Klingons as we understand it. And so once they become dominant, all of the Klingons become dominant and it becomes a eugenics thing. And that's why you have the dominant Klingons. Um, that's the only explanation I could think of that would make sense based on what they've given us. That would work, but will they? Would they actually do that? Um, I'm not sure if they will. To be honest, um, um, I mean, you know, I've heard rumours that it was actually Brian Fuller's suggestion that they changed the look of the Kit Klingons because they wanted to have um, something representative where all the houses were a different colour or had sort of like some sort of different thing going on. So, so it's on like, um, you know, presented us with a Klingon racial diversity. Um, I've been looking on Twitter, um, and I looked on Twitter, and uh, amongst the uh, top hat trending hashtags for today, believe yeah. it or not, is Klingons. <laughs> so, um, but we, we're recording this, folks, on um, on Monday, twenty fifth of uh, September. It's just one day after 
the shows I had in the States. It's just been on Netflix here in the UK today. So that that's why Klingons is trending. So um, don't check your Twitter accounts because our information on this is kind of a little bit out of date when it comes to that sort of thing. But, you know, there's all sorts on, on Twitter about at the moment. Um, you know, stuff to do, you know, even Jason Isaacs is getting involved and saying, no, look, I can't really tweet right now. I'm busy dealing with the Klingons <laughs> and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm quite looking forward to seeing what he does with the uh, with the Lark character next, next week because Lark, uh, I think Lark is kind of going to be their version of Garth of Itza. Ah, okay. Okay. You know, because he, he, from from what little I've read, Lark is supposed to be quite unstable, ah. um, but a great military tactician, but not a particularly good ship's commander. Which would explain why he doesn't mind having a mutineer on board. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm quite looking forward to seeing what develops there uh, in, in next week's. I mean, I, I'm, I'm game to go with it for the, for the whole season. I am too, because even, even if it's not Star Trek the way I would like it to be, it's at least interesting enough in itself that it's, that it's worth following and seeing where it goes. My one caveat to this, and, and it's purely subjective, is Sarek and Amanda. They cannot screw up Sarek and Amanda. They've got to get them right. Um, Sarek and Amanda were one of my first ships um, back before the internet was a thing, back before shipping was a thing. They were one of my first ships. I absolutely adore them. And uh, and I really, really want James Frain and whichever actors they've gotten to play Amanda to get some real material uh, because those, those, two, those two are just absolutely adorable. And I love them. Yeah, well, the thing, uh, thing is, to get, get get someone playing Amanda alongside James Rain, they're going to need a really, really strong actress. Yes, and hopefully uh, they got one. Uh, because they they specifically said, um, even in the middle of all this fracas with changes in showrunners and all this other stuff that they're doing and, and what Munevez was not or you know doing or not doing relative to all of this, they said that Amanda was going to be in there. So, and given the setup of, of Burnham as their foster daughter or whatever it is that's going on with that, um, Amanda's going to have to be in there because she's basically Burnham's foster mother. She's basically, she's basically Burnham's equivalent of Eliza Danvers. Mm-hmm. So she's, they're going to have to bring her in and she's going to have to be someone who can stand up to James Frain and, and, play, and play like these two are actually a couple because they're a couple. Because the way they were written in both the show and in in tie-in stuff, you know, because when the high-end writers did tie-in stuff, um, they were written as a power couple. You know, they were they were written as you know forces to be reckoned with. So you know they they can't screw that up. They've got to get it right. Yeah, they've got to get it right. You know, I mean, I I think you know. For everything, they, for every big thing they got wrong, they got quite a lot right, really. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and so you know, I don't know. I mean, what would you say to the to the absolute Star Trek purists that I say I'm not watching this? Klingons look funny, and it's not in um, continuity and all that. You know. I'm, I would say that sadly, Star Trek as we understand it is no more. Mm, it and and it's as painful as that is. Um, the the previous the older iterations will always be there if you want to watch reruns i would recommend you watch reruns and i do you know when i have time do so um but the series as it existed um and, and then of course fan productions like net like um star trek continues um which will bow out in a couple of episodes regrettably but they will have given us you know 11 really awesome episodes that frankly even with a lower budget at a narrative level are going to talk not all of what discovery will do but a good chunk of what discovery will do by definition and that's going to be how that's just going to have to be how it is um, I, I personally think you're right i mean this this new series really star trek for the 21st century and um, you know let, let's face it you know so like uh, enterprise when it was on um yeah. It struggled because it didn't change anything in the formula. The formula had been the same throughout Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, sorry, were different. So they ch- make they changed the formula a little bit for DS9 because it had to change because it was sort of like um, gunfight at the OK Corral on a space station sort of thing. Yeah. Whereas um, the um, 
you know, with Voyager and Enterprise, nothing much changed. They just saw, like, Enterprise, they went to a prequel. Enterprise, you know, one 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 of the things that I'm not a purist to say was that, in you know, at, at the time when Enterprise was on, well, it looks too modern to be a prequel. It's looks too modern to be 100 years before Kirk. That was yeah. that, that was one of the issues I had with, you know, with, with both Enterprise and, frankly, Discovery. Um, and so. that, that's the issue we got with Discovery now, sort of thing, that, that I was just going to, you know, say you kind of finished for me. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, you know... It's Star Trek for the 21st century, you know, and, you know, I think even if they don't change the Klingons, I think a majority of Star Trek fans will probably watch it and make it work. Yeah. You know, you know as, in, as in those that are really diehard that want to watch Star Trek no matter what, which I, I consider myself to be one of those Star Trek fans. Um, that's why I that's why I wasted um, cinema money on, on the uh, JJ Trek movies. I was kind of hoping they'd get better. And they did kind of get better with the third one. Rel- relative to what they, what's gone before, yeah. But I, and, he, and here's the thing, I'm going to be very blunt. Um, they stopped making Star Trek for me when Next Gen ended. I enjoyed bits and pieces of, <clears throat> of Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Enterprise very much. And, I'm, and I will never regret watching the other spinoffs because each of the other spinoffs offered me something. Mm-hmm. But the only spinoff that offered me everything I wanted or nearly everything I wanted all in one space from beginning to end was Next Gen. Yeah. And so I've had to, I've had to adjust, I've had, I've had to adjust my expectations. I had to start adjusting my expectations with Deep Space Nine. And so I was, I was already doing that with Deep Space Nine, and that, and that process simply continued as the years went by. Mm. With me, I started having to adjust my de- expectations with Voyager. Mm, because, okay. and, and Voyager really, me, for me, was like the weakest of the modern track shows. I mean, a lot of people say Enterprise, I say Voyager. I can I can see that argument, although although um, <laughs> although Enterprise at least had uh, Jeffrey Combs as Shran. So mm-hmm. any any time that they give Jeffrey Combs a character in the Star Trek universe, I will I'll give him points. Yeah. And, and 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 Archer had that had had his little dog, which I loved. Yeah. Um, and Archer's relationship with Shran was just bringing the played. Oh my god, it was. The show was worth watching, just, just watching the two-handers between those two actors. I swear to God. Um, it, it's, it's like they were on a different show. Because those two actors were on, were on a show I actually wanted to watch when they were on the screen together. Mm-hmm. And um, so they, they just couldn't maintain the consistency. So Yeah, I mean, you know, it's always good when you got that triumvirate of um, Archer, Saval, and, um, and, and Shran. Yes. When, when the three of them had a scene together. <laughs> oh, God. That was so sort of like even even better, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, Enterprise was the beginning of of of, of this of this uh, prequel thing. Um, I, I'd actually say that Discovery is a prequel, but done better than Enterprise. Uh, in, yeah, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, not to take away from what Enterprise did. It did struggle along for two years, and then it started getting better in season three, and got really, really good in season four. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that Discovery kind of takes a similar path. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I've realized that yeah, even even if this is disappointing relative to my inner Trekkie, uh, this story, whatever it is, won't be boring and will at least be worth my time if if only to watch the actors' performances. So that's worth sticking it out, you know, at, at least for this mm-hmm. first season. And then, you know, whatever we get subsequently is what we get subsequently. Well, in answer to your uh, little query before, um, the on the After Track show last night, you know, that, that was on, and I watched it this afternoon, uh, another thing they were asked about was, uh, was Klingons. And apparently we're going to get a lot of Klingons this year. I'm going to get a lot of Sarek, I'm going to get a lot of Burnham, and Amanda's going to come in later on. Um, they didn't say how much later on though. They might mean next season. I don't know. But what what they what 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 they did say is that they they prob- they're probably going to tie up the Klingon War thing this year. Good. So it's, Good. Prob- it's probably going to get to the point of the ceasefire that 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 was uh, discussed in Star Trek the original series. Oh, the 
Kidama records. Yeah, okay. not not yeah. the Kid, not the Kidama records. The actual ceasefire in the original series. The Kidama oh. records came after. Oh, that's right. Okay, okay. So, so they, all right. But you know they they're gonna get get to that, um, which probably means that the next season they might do a bit more exploring of of um of new worlds and new civilizations and Luanians and what have what have you. Yeah. But I'm hoping yeah. we get a bit of that this season as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm also quite interested in Rain Wilson's Harry Mudd and seeing what his version of of that character is in this context. Mm, me too. I mean, from the little I've seen of it, it looks pretty damn good. Yes. And it looks pretty damn on 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 the nose in terms of what you'd imagine um, a Harry Mudd ten years before the actual Harry Mudd that we come to know and love. I mean, let's face it, we only seen him two times in the series, and maybe maybe another two times in 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 the animated film series. Right. Right. Oh, did he have three episodes in the series? It was it was two it was two in the series proper and I can't remember the animated. So. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't remember the animated, but could always find it. So it's yeah. all on Netflix. Um, mm-hmm. um, but the um, you know it seems pretty much on the nose. But I'm kind of hoping that they they made him a little bit more dangerous. He seemed a little more dangerous in the snippet that we got in, in the coming up this season bit at the end of episode two. So yeah. It, they could it could be worth doing. No, this whatever this is, despite despite my qualms as as an old school Trekkie, um, if you if I, you know whatever issues I have on that level, this won't be boring, and this will this will be worth watching, uh, just to see how it plays out and stuff. I'm just hoping that the Star Trek elements we get are as well realized as they could be. Apart from the Klingons, which won't be, unfortunately. So, um, what's your plan? Are you going to keep CBS on access for the duration of the series? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating it. I don't know. It's, I can't really afford it. It's my biggest issue right now. Um, one of the one of the reasons why I'm putting off most of my um, most of my streaming service stuff is because my my uh, rent includes a cable package. And my rent is already pretty steep. So, mm. and and I'm on um, I'm on uh, assistance. So my my discretionary income is not endless. And even though it's not a lot of money per se in it, in itself, it adds up relative to my overall bills. So I'm going to have to think about how I want to approach this. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I'm actually uh, I'm actually in a similar situation. Um, um, I'm going to be um, after Christmas, uh, maybe just before. I'm going to be uh, cutting my Sky package down, um, just basically because, I'm like, um, for the box sets, I don't really use the box sets, so I can get rid of those. That'll probably save me about a tenner. I hope. <laughs> um, and the films, I don't need those. That'll save me another tenner. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my I'm I'm kind of upset because I want to cut the cord because I'm on such a restricted income, relatively speaking. But what I'm finding is that everybody's going to have a streaming service, and so getting all of these streaming services is going to be more expensive than keeping a cable package. Eventually, mm. it it already is for some people, and I'm seeing I'm seeing that complaint. So at whatever point I do officially cut the cord, which will probably be sometime after whatever this cable package is, and I'm no, no longer living here and I no longer have access to it, I'm only paying for one streaming service, come hell or high water. I can't mm. afford more than one streaming service. Yeah, you know. And, and so and so, whatever I do after that is whatever I do after that. I can't afford more than one streaming service. That's just how it is. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, as so long as you've got internet, you've got other options. Yes, yes. Um, which we will not encourage. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, m- moving on. Um, so the verdict on, on Star Trek Discovery, if we was to mark it out of uh, five stars, what would you give it? Oh, right now, based on the first two episodes, mm-hmm. let's call it a 3.75. Oh yeah, I I I go I go for a, I go for a generous a fairly generous three point nine, not quite a four. I mean, once we see more episodes, it'll be easier to judge. But based on these first two, three point seven five. Okay, moving on to the uh, the little green duck that I want to shoot, the Orville. Uh, the Orville is probably 
problematic for different reasons. Um, the part of me that is a more old school Trekkie appreciates the episode structure greatly mm -hmm. um, and appreciates the fact that Seth MacFarlane, for all his other issues, is obviously an old school Trekkie like me. And so if you're looking for something that is closer to old school Trek, the Orville is actually better than is actually better than Discovery. However, the Orville is not without its own problems. Yeah, I mean the um, very obvious jokes for one. Um, I I just personally think you should stop trying to be a comedy. Uh, yeah, it, it, it works. It works better when they play it straight. It really does. Based on what based on what we see in, in the last episode about a girl, which was probably the best episode they've done today. It um, is. If they if they stop making it a comedy or stop making it sort of like such a crude comedy, and kind of made it into sort of like a night sort of like gentle comedic drama. Yes, it it probably do. It probably take a lot less stick off the uh, off the critics and and uh, and be enjoyed more by the fans. I mean, I really enjoyed about a girl. I thought it was a really good good episode, but it was very obvious it was going to go that way from from what happened in the tail end of the uh, previous one. Yes, yes. Um, but the, the the debate that they had felt very very sort of like uh, very very current in so many ways because we're hearing news reports about uh, about about kids that are wanting to be that 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 that, that are transgender that so sort of like kids you know supposedly knowing that they 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 want yeah. to be a girl or they want to be a boy or yeah. or what have you sort of yeah. thing so in in that sense the debate that they had in 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 the in the episode felt very current in in that sort of sense yes yes and they played what they had quite well i just i like you i question some of their structural decisions and that's, and that's down to McFarlane, because McFarlane is a mixed blessing. We have the Orville because he's a Trekkie, mm -hmm. and, because, and because he's an unapologetic Trekkie, but he's also Seth McFarlane. <laughs> and you either like Seth McFarlane stuff or you don't. I love Family Guy. I've got to admit, I love Family Guy. Whenever, whenever I catch an episode of Family Guy, I'll sit down and watch it. Um, if for nothing else, for Stewie. Stewie <laughs> is my absolute hero. <laughs> you know, um, everything I do in life, I I I run it by Stewie first, um, because, <laughs> like, um, because he's brilliant. Um, but this one, this doesn't feel as good as Family Guy. You can get away with the crude humor on Family Guy and stuff like that because it's more of a cartoon. Yes, I guess. yeah. Although it... um, you got the sense that McFarlane is beginning to toward the beginning there that he is beginning to understand that he needed to tone the humor down because there was even a, a sort of meta scene where he was was interacting with Vortis in episode two, I think it was, and he literally looks at him and says, deadpan, I don't think I'm going to try humor with you anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that was, all, apart from anything else, that was also McFarlane's meta commentary on, I think that he, he knows he needs to tone it down. And episode three was toned down. Um, relative to what we had gotten previously, so I think I think he knows. Uh, he just needs to figure out how to be Seth MacFarlane in this context without going over the edge. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the reasons that last episode was also uh, felt more like like a Star Trek episode was based because Brandon Braga wrote it. <gasps> In which I hadn't seen. So I, the credits often go by too quickly for me to process, but that's kind of awesome. Well, I didn't see the credits. I actually heard that it was Brandon Braga that wrote it. <laughs> mm, um, okay. Talking of which, I'm trying to get something up here that Seth MacFarlane's done other than the Orville. Um, he's been involved in um, in in a documentary series that's um, I think it's called Beyond the Cosmos or something with. Um, Oh God, I forget his name. Um, he's got. Oh, oh food. yes, I saw that. That was awesome. I watched every yeah. episode of that, and it was wonderful. That was um, um it was a reboot of Cosmos uh, with Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah, yeah. And it and it was um, yeah, it was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, and they I, and they even got they even got um, uh, Patrick Stewart to play one of the one of the scientists in one of the um, historical portions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching that. I've been really enjoying that. It's, um, it's that was lovely. Nice. That was lovely. And I, I had forgotten about that. Thank you for reminding me because Seth MacFarlane is, is obviously a space geek. God love him. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I was looking for that in his credits and, it, you know, he's so far down his credits. Uh, it's basically under all that stuff that he's produced, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. But he produced that with Brandon Braga. Mm, okay, so, that makes yeah. sense. Um, but I... Yeah. 
I, I really, I've really enjoyed that. And Neil deGrasse Tyson's just, you know, he's just bringing that narration and um, and 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 laying stuff out and making it simple. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I quite enjoy watching him. He's quite chilled out. Yeah, he's, he's marvelous. He's marvelous. He's he's because he, Cosmos was basically a reboot of the original Carl Sagan, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is very much this generation's Carl Sagan. That's that's the point of him. Well, and that's actively what he's trying to be so the absolute cool part about it is in in one of the episodes he talks about having met Carl Sagan for the first time yes and tells yes, a story about not being able to get a bus back and he's invited to stay over you know until he can get a bus back or something yeah um you know sort of like so, so that that was pretty cool but yes. you know but that's um you know, I didn't. I didn't actually. You know, when I seen Seth MacFarlane's name come up on that, I was quite surprised because I've only really known him for comedy, for stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you reminded me of that because I, I completely blanked on that. But he, he did do that, and and I, I adored his uh, reboot of Cosmos. I thought that was perfect. I thought his reboot of Cosmos was exactly what it needed to be because I remember watching the original with Carl Sagan when I was a kid, and um, and and this was this was a worthy successor. So yeah. Yeah, I think they need to do more stuff like that for kids now. Yes. Um, because it's not not enough stuff like this on kids television now. It's all flipping SpongeBob SquarePants and cartoons and and stuff that frankly doesn't really educate. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I know that people of an older generation say we had better entertainment in our day, but I think in our case it was actually true. I, th- I think we had better, I think we had, generally we had better edutain- edutainment, you know, as in educational entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Um, although that said, you know, Horrible Histories used to be quite good, which was made in the sort of like late 90s, early 2000s. Mm. Um, that was quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's um that that's that was a kids show that was on BBC. Mm. Um, so if you ever ch- ever have a chance, to try and look that one up on, online. You'll see sk- skits from it. It's <laughs> really funny. It's a bit like Monty Python does history, but for kids. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Orville. I I don't know. I'm I'm thinking. I might carry on reviewing it for a little while, um, but it's going to get to a point where I get fed up of reviewing it and just want to watch it. Yeah, I'm going to... Episode... I was thinking about dumping it, but episode three has earned them some leeway. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really what it's done with me. I mean, I was, I was getting ready to dump it at episode two, to be quite honest. Mm, and, um, and Discovery is imperfect enough in its own right that I think I'm going to need the Orville as an alternative for a while at least until I get a better sense of what discovery is and isn't going to be. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Well, uh, moving on to, uh, other stuff, we've got, uh, TV shows coming back. We have the arrow coming back. We have flash coming back and legends of tomorrow and, and stuff like that. I mean, I know that DC, uh, the DC action, I was probably going to take over from us discussing those shows. So, me and you are gonna to have to try and find other shows to discuss while they, they those guys do those shows over the um over, over the over the autumn winter months and into spring of next year. Yeah, or the so. or or if, or if it comes to it, they're gonna be they're gonna be certain episodes or ideas that will want to bring a different perspective to. So there may be some episodes that we discuss along with them, depending on what we get. But yes, I think we're gonna to have to divvy it up that way. <laughs> Well, um, I know we've got MacGyver coming back on Friday, which, uh, you know... I don't watch. Yeah, you I, don't watch. I don't. Um, I'm probably going to watch anyway to for the sake of, uh, of reviewing it in the hopes that the producers see what I'm saying and see reason and, and actually do the sensible thing and kill Jack Dalton. Oh, my God. <laughs> um... But, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to watch it to, to review the first couple, I think, and then I'm probably going to ditch it um, and look for something else. But we have Timeless coming back next year. And on this Thank you, God. Day. So at some point, the, the problem I'm having is because, because Timeless was cancelled and came back in such a adorably haphazard way, um, they haven't given us a premiere date on that one yet. Mm-hmm. So Because they, they're still busy trying to figure out when it's going to film. <laughs> Lesson. A so. show that I really want to talk about very briefly is Electric Dreams. Yes, I've seen the first episode. I'm gonna, I have. I didn't, wasn't going to have time for the second one until um, until after we're through here. But I've, I've read reviews of the second one, and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, so. Dominic adored it. 
Um, yes. He didn't even know about the series until I told him this week. And um, with him being based in the UK um, yeah. and with him not having the access that I've got to other shows and stuff like that and, 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 and whatnot, I said, hey, Dominic, there's a show on at the moment which is Right Wheel Street. I'm really enjoying it, um, but it's the sort of thing you really enjoy. Because Dominic's a hardcore science fiction reader. Mm. You know, he reads Asimov, he reads or like Philip K. Dick, he reads he, he reads a lot of the old uh, a lot of the old classic sci fi writers, you know, that were involved in Star Trek the original series. Mm. Um, you yes. know, you name yes. it, he's read it. Yes. Um yes. so um I knew this was gonna be right up his street. So I I, I gave him a call and says, Hey Dominic, uh, there's a new show on. Um we get it before the US. It's called Electric Dreams. It's on Channel 4 every Sunday. Would you like to review it? And yeah. he goes, yeah. So, you know, he's happy for the next four weeks, I think. Yeah, so I think yeah. Only six and, um, it's good for me because it's, it involves some, some Philip K. Dick stories that I wasn't, from, that I wasn't familiar with. I, I think uh. it's involving Philip K. Dick stories that not a lot of people are familiar with because most people know him for his full-blown nov- novellas and yeah, yeah. not really for his short stories. I'm just wondering how many short stories he actually wrote, and if there's enough. Oh, quite, a, quite a few. He was he was very prolific. Because I, I loved the first two episodes. Next ep, next episode's called The Traveller or something with Timothy Spall. Mm, you know, if anything okay. else, it would be good because Timothy Spall's just an excellent actor. Yeah, yeah. Because apart from the narrative, it's just good to see these actors do their stuff, and, they, mm. and you've got a lot of really good actors over there. Mm-hmm. And Geraldine mm. Chapman was in the last one, the uh, daughter of Charlie Chapman. Oh. Cool, cool. You know, um, but Mass Nights was really, really good. Um, it was about a couple of con men, you know, to a travel agency, and they they tried to con an old woman out of um, out out of her her life savings. This old woman she's like three hundred and fifty years old, and she's got a robot that's older than she is, and she wants to go back to Earth. The problem is, Earth no longer exists. So, you know, the, these two guys, Connor and one of them has an attack of conscience and, uh, you know, tries to tag her, but, you know, he just doesn't quite have the courage in him. But you get the impression that she kind, she's kind of figured it out anyway. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, it was a really strong episode. Um, I really enjoyed it and uh, I just hope that he gets another series. It, it should because they've got enough material to go with. Um, yeah, but it, it it's not based based on the material about whether it gets another series or not. It's based on how well it does in ratings and stuff. And, uh, you know, okay. Unfortunately, it would be an anthology series, and an anthology series in the sense of it's a bit like Black Mirror. Those sort of things don't always hit. Uh, okay. Know. Um. So I'm hoping this one's a hit. Uh, so. Because it's kind, uh, I think it's kind of the spiritual successor on Channel Four to Black Mirror. Uh, okay. Yeah. I was surprised that Channel 4 lost Black Mirror to Netflix. It says a lot. Um, I wasn't. I mean, you know, you've seen some of the crazy decisions our network, te- you know, our network television stations made. I mean, let's face it, uh, Channel 5 um, picked up once upon a time for the first season, then ditched out the second season, and Netflix got it. Uh. Um, and, you know, um, I wasn't surprised about that happening at all, really. Because Channel 5 has been, you know, Channel 5 and Channel 4, now it's mostly populated by reality TV. That's really sad. You know, it's the same with BBC. Well, BBC is mostly news, current affairs t- style stuff. Um, you know, Channel 4's news, current affairs mixed with reality TV. There's some drama on there, but not, you know, cranky not enough. And what drama there is or, or is, co- is co-productions... For the for the US market as well as UK, so mm-hmm. and so. Um, you know Channel Five, we've got a couple of Australian soaps. Then it's mostly sort of like um, some some US drama, but the US drama it gets is generally already been seen on the cable stations, so mm. it's kind of syndicated, I guess, by the point it gets to Channel Five. Okay. Um, okay. You know, and it's, I mean, Channel 5 has gotten too big, to be honest. It's grown too big for its boots. It's got sort of like all these other channels. It's got 5 Star. It's got 5 US and and stuff like that. Whereas Channel 4 has got E4, more 4, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, And and BBC, it's BBC 1, BBC 2, BBC 4, and BBC 3 is available only online now. Uh Ah, 
Yeah. Um, so. But to, to, to get back to D.C., um, at, least, uh, for, at least for this season, it, and, and it could change, but going into this season for all of the D.C. shows that I watched, the CW ones, um, I'm actually, I'm, at this point, I'm watching the shows for subplots. Um, what's going on with the titular characters isn't as interesting to me as, as some of the subplots. Mm-hmm. Like, Super, like Supergirl, I am waiting with bated breath for Mirren Jones um, as played by Carl Lumley. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, on, on Arrow, I'm waiting for Black Siren. On uh, The Flash, I want more on Killer Frost. Um, I'm looking forward to the crossover. The crossover is Crisis on um, Infinite Crisis on Into Earth the... X. You know? Yeah. And, and Russell Toby is going to be playing the Ray. And it's going to be just, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I'm looking forward to in terms of subplots. Um, but the main plots are, at least for this season, uh, of less interest to me going in. That may change based on what they give us, but going in, that's how I'm, I'm, I'm viewing these things. Mm-hmm. So. I, I find it interesting to read how different the actual plots are, plots are to how, how they are in the comics. Actually, I prefer to, there's a level at which I prefer the live action version simply because the live action versions are streamlined. Um, as, as fun as, as fun as I found the comics that I read to the extent that I read comics, one of the reasons why I don't read more apart from my vision issues is that I find the comics, the canon comics a little too convoluted for my tastes. Um, mm. they just, just, they just keep going and going and going and going and going and, and, and rebooting and rebooting and rebooting and retconning. And I'm like, God's sake, just chill out. <laughs> you know, it's, no, no, none of these storylines are that important. And one of the one of the things I like about the live action universes, as problematic as they can be on some levels, you know, depending on the CW ness of it all, is that the, is that the live action storylines are streamlined, and the writers on those shows actually have to make choices and apply narrative economy and limit themselves, and that's a good thing. Uh, because mm-hmm. a lot of these canon storylines can just get out of control. Yeah, I mean, I've got a, I've got a mission in life this year, and that is to break into the Arrow writers' room and uh, get hold of as many scripts as I can that I've not filmed yet, and write Anicity and Felicity out of every single one of them. Or failing that, at least write them better. Because here's here's the thing, and, he, and here's here's where I'm a lit geek. Okay, you know you know for a fact I'm an I'm, I'm an old school lit geek. I I, I review the, um, the Big Finish Classics range because I'm a lit geek and because those old stories mean a great deal to me. And I don't despise the relationships on CW because they're there. I despise them because they're badly written. I despise them because a network that, that prides itself on the soap tropes and on the romance tropes can't write them well. I, I, I personally think that they're overwritten. They are overwritten. You know, they, they are. They, you know, they, they could they could get away with doing a hang of a lot less, and it actually, you know, work better if they did a hang of a lot less. Yeah. So the thing is, being a classic lit geek, um, I judge a lot of the contemporary romances based on the classic ones that I've read and have become quite fond of. I mean, my ships, my ships, to borrow a modern term are largely classic lit ships or variations on classic lit ships. And I, for instance, I judge love triangle narratives based on the love triangle at the center of my favorite play, not by Shakespeare, which is Edmund Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac. The triangle at the center of Cyrano is exquisite. That's how you write triangles, okay? And relative to Cyrano, most contemporary triangles are frankly pedestrian shite. Mm. And that's what, and that's when they're written well. Yeah, so I, I say predictable shite. <laughs> 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 you know, but, but then again, you know, sort of like, uh, for example, Star Trek Discovery. The 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 um, all, all the and this isn't a romance trope at all. This yeah. was about the shock death that all the entertainment magazines were going. Oh my God! Shot death in episode two. Oh no, Captain Giorgio's dead. And I thought, oh, for fuck's sake, she was dead from the moment she was cast. Yes, because <laughs> Michelle Yeoh doesn't stay. That's the whole point of Michelle Yeoh. 
She's too big for it, you know. She's sort of like too too big of a an actress, international star for it. I'm not talking Hollywood. I'm talking Hong Kong as well, and yes, and stuff like that. She she just wouldn't have been able to commit to more than a couple of episodes. So it was pretty obvious that she was going to die right from the moment she was cast, and it was pretty obvious she was going to die in order to properly set up Michael Burnham and the tragedy of that character. Yes, you know so. I, I wasn't the least bit surprised and it just really bugged me how how big of a deal Entertainment Week you made of it. <laughs> yes, and the, her loss was all the harder because I knew it was coming. I'm like, dude, you go to all this trouble for two episodes to establish Michelle Yeoh as the captain of a ship and we lose her. Mm. Oh my God. And it, and it wasn't the shock of the death, it was the how dare you do this? How dare you do this bait and switch that we know is a bait and switch with an awesome actress that I would love to see as the captain of a starship for the whole freaking thing, mm. you know? And it's like, this is insane. So they, they, the industry needs to handle shock deaths differently altogether. This mm. isn't, this is, this isn't about, about any one show. This is systemic now. They need to just rethink shock deaths. Yeah, they, they need to just maybe not announce the big guest star that they've got. Keep it yeah. under wraps. I mean, this is to go to tie this back to DC, which we're talking about now. This is this is a variation of the same problem they had with the mystery grave, you know, and 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 and, and killing off Laurel Lance. Because by the time they killed off Laurel Lance, it's like nobody gave a, a shit. Non, it's an, it's a non-event. You know, why are you wasting our time for a non-event? You know, this is, it, was, it was pathetic. And, and it was indicative of how these deaths are handled in general now. And it's, it's got to stop. They've got to rethink this. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, as um, is, is much as we railed against Star Trek, the, the JJ movies, and, um, and some people are railing against the Star Wars movies and that now, which, I, you know, I don't get that because I still enjoy the Star Wars movies. Uh, yeah. Don't give a shit what people say. Star Wars is sci-fi fantasy. It's always going to be sci-fi fantasy, and I'm always going to enjoy it as that, no matter who's behind the helm. Um, yeah, although they could have, they could have really done without Jar Jar Binks. He was a problem. Yeah, well, that 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 was that was a George Lucas thing. Um, but you know, one of the things that J.J. Abrams managed to get right with Star Wars, and and they're still doing it now with Star Wars. And also with, with 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 his Star Trek movies, not so much the second one, but definitely the first one, mm-hmm. was the, the 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 way he was able to sort of like keep it all ambiguous with the press and not give out any plot details or any plot details that were too big yeah. that was happening. Yeah. Um, you know that, that so so maybe maybe the TV writers and producers should take a leaf out of his book in 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 terms of how he managed to keep so much secret. Yeah. Yeah, you know, on 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 those films and 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 things. I mean, it's probably harder to do with a TV series than it is with a movie, but you know. Yeah, yeah, they they've got to try because this is getting stupid now. You know, it's, it's getting stupid now. It is. Um. Anyway, um, is there anything else we can discuss? Any any new shows coming up that you're looking forward to? Uh apart from the apart from the DC things, I'm I'm looking forward to. Uh, Stranger Things. Oh, yeah, that's coming up soon. Yeah, that's coming up soon. Um, and I'm also looking forward to... Um, I'm also looking forward to um, Ash vs. the Evil Dead Season 3, given the, especially given the kerfuffle over Season 2 and the change of direction, which I'm actually thankful for. I really didn't want Kelly to have been who she was originally planned to be. Uh-huh. So... so um, but um, th- those two shows I'm looking forward to in terms of the shows most immediately coming up. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm the same with those two shows. Um, I'm probably, I'm probably going to add The Punisher to that, um, which um, I don't think they've actually got a date yet, but I've, I've, I've heard rumours that it's going to be sometime in October. There's been a rumour going around it's going to be October 13th. Yeah. That, that yeah. starts, but I'm not sure if that's right. No, I might give... I didn't watch Defenders because I just wasn't in the mood. I might give Punisher... Tr- uh, uh, chance simply because he's more unapologetically 
a revenge narrative, and I do enjoy revenge plays. Just straight up, no kidding around, a lot of people are going to die now, revenge plays. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it, that's a little more cathartic for me uh, than people sitting around, you know, contemplating their navels and, and wondering whether they're going to do the right thing or not. I don't care. Yeah. You know, it's like either, either shoot them or don't shoot them, but do whatever you're going to do with conviction. And whatever issues you might have with the Punisher, he at least does what he does with conviction. Yeah, well, and that's... I'm gonna... and that's more interesting to watch for me. I'm going to um, write a play now and call it Raisa with a shotgun. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm about there in terms of all these shows. Cause I, I can't, I can't take the existential crises that seem to drive a lot of these narratives now. It's like for Christ's sake, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry you're so damaged. But frankly, the only DC characters to use, you know, comic book characters as an example, the only DC characters who have any right to complain are the ones who are literally the last of their species. Oh, everybody no. else, every, everybody else has got first world problems compared yeah. to the, the folks on on thirty eight. Like, so. like Superman, but you know, to be honest, I don't like Superman. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Okay. So um, that's a wrap for this episode. Um. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um. Hopefully, we can record another one of these next week because um for next week's episode um I have uh an interview with uh Caroline Cave. Um, who is best known for her role as Debbie in Saw 6, but she's going to be making a recurring appearance in the uh, new season of Van Helsing, which starts up on October 5th on Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, okay. So that's going to be quite quite a present one. Uh, but she, she's, she's really cool to speak to. I, I really enjoyed speaking with her, and that interview is going to be a really good one once, it, once it's edited up. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so... Um, but that's it for this week uh, thanks for listening and uh, keep your eye out for DC Action Hour and uh, new episodes of Genretainment coming up when? I don't know but they're coming up <laughs>